Welcome to Gradnall and Cascade Division in Enscale. Been doing some work now to actually start getting some track down so the eagle eyed amongst you might see that there is actually some, uh, well, there's actually a lot of Atlas Code 55 track hanging out. So I've got the sub roadbed built for the Seattle Station's area, both for King Street Station and for Union Station. So that's on two uh, eight foot long lengths, 16 inches wide, so 16 feet total. Uh, by 16 inches wide. Uh, they're raised up two inches on rises all the way down so that I can get um, some interesting uh, elevation differences on the scenery as I come around the rest of the layout here for the return loop. And once I then go around the back of the center peninsula, over on the other side for Inter Bay Yard, up through Salmon Bay Bridge into then Everett and Snohomish. So there's about 90 feet or so of Atlas Code 55 track down, six turnouts that are also then controlling. There are four platforms that go into King Street Station, three platforms that go into Union Station. As with all of this layout, it is somewhat built towards the prototype. It is not an absolutely prototypical railroad. Uh, proto freelance, I guess, if you wanted to explain it, if you're new to the channel. So I'm kind of following along with the ideas of what it looks like, but also then putting a little bit of my own spin onto it, wanting to condense some parts of it like you you could make your entire layout just about these two just about these two sessions in Seattle um, and I have so much else that I need to do I kind of have to uh, you know pick my battles scope things down just a little bit otherwise I'm, I'm really never gonna get this finished and I might never actually get this finished anyway um, so this video I want to go through what some of the track plan actually looks like talk a little bit about how uh, I kind of came to the design that I did kind of some of the considerations that I had and then actually start getting into putting this sub road bed down bringing it up on the risers I get the player with top in place making sure everything's level and then quickly starting to put down some track to see what it looks like none of the track is attached none of the actual sub road bed is down for the track um, nothing is wired up it's just to kind of get some kind of idea of what things might start to look like as we move forward so i hope you enjoy this one thanks for watching bye bye all right so i'm going to slowly start to figure out getting this mass of track stuff over into the area on the layout where we're going to have the seattle station so we're going to have king street station and then Union Station on the near side. And then I think it's 4th Avenue splits them raised up high. The stations themselves are kind of depressed down below, uh, below the level of where the roads are. So um, it's all Atlas Code 55 flex track and then very, very broad number 10 turnouts. And we're looking at long passenger trains that have got three or four uh, engines on the front and then anywhere between nine and 12 or 13 of those long 90 south foot passenger cars so very broad turnouts to go through the station area and then in and out of that turnaround loop um, do have some caboose industries uh, ground throws as well just manual ground throws just to start out so i've got at least some control uh, while i figure out exactly what kind of point motors i'm going to use i don't know if i'm going to go all the way for dcc point motor control just because I don't know if I, I kind of want to go that route. The idea would be you would be standing there with your train getting it ready to, to depart. There's not going to be a whole lot of routes that you need to set to be able to do that. Um, previous layouts I have had everything DCC controlled and then it was all done through JMRI because you had to throw four or five turnouts to get the route set. Not necessarily going to be doing that here. So some of the yards possibly, but this might actually be a little bit more low tech than you might be expecting in terms of how I'm going to do the point motors. Um, NMRI gauge as well, just to kind of make sure that everything is engaged and everything is correct. And then I do also have a few different bits of um, styrene here to look at doing a little bit of super elevation on the codes as you go around the return loop. But the first thing that we can try and figure out is actually getting the sub road bed. So I've got some rough plywood sheets that I've just kind of laid down here. Um, I'm thinking everything is going to still be raised up about two inches because as we come around as part of the return loop, I want the port of Seattle in here. And so if we have um, the train track coming through flush with the bench, then it's a little bit hard to have things drop down uh, for the docks. I think I want to raise everything up just a little bit. And then the Sam on the other side where you would end up going through the Salmon Bay Bridge. So have a track plan figured out for this let's let me just look at that a little bit quick um, and then we can start to figure out getting the sub road bed in place and getting a raised up on this so let's look a little bit at the track plan of what we have going on with the seattle station so if we zoom out a little bit 
Um, and we get an idea of the sessions here. This is then coming around for the return loop. Okay, so let's start actually with the return loop. Let's let's focus on that part. Uh, the two lines that are going to come out from the stations to the south will then come together uh, through these two turnouts here. And this part is then going to be the actual return loop itself. So that's where one of those power subdistricts on the Digitrack system will be set up for a return loop. And it's really just going to wind its way around. And so in the middle here, I'm going to model what would be the Port of Seattle, modern, somewhat a little bit more modern day Port of Seattle, maybe. I haven't done a ton of research into what this would be in the 50s and the 60s, but I kind of wanted to have something in here at least. This near side line, as it would run around uh, the framework, I want to have visible. The back line, I'm not sure how much I'm going to have visible or if I'm going to hide it a little bit. This line here would be on the east side of the docks, and so that somewhat kind of goes along with the prototype. The one along the back side, not so much, because technically you've got to get back across the sound here somehow and get back into Seattle. So I might hide this line, might have like an, an overpass coming here and an overpass here, and so maybe this little part is hidden away, but that one's still to be de to be decided, but that's, you know, not a lot to the return loop, but it's fairly straightforward. So let's come and look at the stations then, and kind of like I said at the start of this video, uh, this is based on the prototype, it's not absolutely faithful 100% to the prototype. A little bit freelance, um, taking inspiration from the prototype, and then I'm wanting to make it fit what I wanted to do. So really, I want to be able to park long passenger trains in here. That's kind of what it comes down to. So we've got uh, a mark here for 144 inches, which means that we've got a long 12-foot length. There we go. So I've got you know two, basically, platforms at 12 feet in length. And then we drop down here for King Street Station. This comes down to maybe 10 feet, and then we drop down to maybe 9 feet. And I do actually have it set up so that I, I could have another platform in here. I, originally, I had it on the track plan. I just had another turnout that kind of popped out. And so then now maybe we had uh, 7, 7.5 feet platform. But in the King Street Station, with five platforms, or maybe four platforms and, and kind of a, a through line, but, you know, three or four platforms, that kind of seems enough. You know, we would have Great Northern and Northern Pacific in there, but you wouldn't have had seven platforms full of trains. Those passenger trains are sitting there. They're not out there moving passengers. They're not making any money. So I think that this will work out okay. And then just to the other side, we then have Union Station. Union Station is what the Milwaukee Road would have used. Union Pacific would have come into here as well. And so splitting all the way down the middle here, this gap is where 4th Avenue South would be. And so that would actually be raised up a little bit. Um, you know, somewhat common at the time, these stations, the station buildings, you would actually approach from road level. That was all raised up, and then you would come down some steps to the platforms, down some steps to the platforms. Okay, so 4th Avenue South is going to be a raised, I think it's four-lane highway, um, that would kind of split between the two stations. And then Union Station is just three platforms, not going to be you doing as much passenger traffic at all. Really, I've got the Olympian Hiawatha from Milwaukee Road. It's a cool train. Um, I do like the look of uh, the City of Portland train for Union Pacific. Carter do have a model for the City of Los Angeles, which uh, maybe would be close enough if I swap out the name board. And I'll call that good. I don't know how much... Uh, I want to dig into it the same way that I have with uh, the Empire Builders to make them, you know, pretty much 100% faithful. But this gives me, in total, seven platforms, potentially eight if I add another one in here. It'll all be Atlas Code 55 track. All the turnouts are number 10 turnouts, really, really broad turnouts. Um, they're, you know, 10 or 11 inches long. They're pretty long, broad turnouts. But again, long passenger trains coming through. I wanted to have as broad of a turnout as I could do. And probably going to keep it fairly uh, low-tech as well, like I said. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have DCC control for these. going to start out probably just with manual ground throws. Um, but at some point, probably look at moving towards uh, tortoise switch machines um, or server-based switch machines. I'm using some of the Tam Valley Depot products. But I don't think I'm going to hook it into DCC. There's, there's not a lot that's really going on. In my previous layout for Newcastle Central, which was a, a HO slash double O, 
scale layout of a big passenger train station in the UK. I think I had 23 turnouts in total uh, going across 12 different platforms, accessing from both the north and the south for arrivals and departures. And the whole layout was really best around this. I don't want this to be that complicated. I just want somewhere where I can park these passenger trains, call at the end of call at the end of the layout here in Seattle, a return loop to then bring the trains back so that you can start that uh, eastbound departure to get you back to Spokane. So this is, you know, pretty set on what the track plan is going to be here. Um, you know, once we actually then start to put it on the layout and they get a little bit more of a sense of scale, maybe it's too big, um, maybe they don't need, you know, full 12 feet long platforms, we'll see how it goes. Um, but let's, let's start to move over and start to actually do a little bit of work on the layout now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the actual mechanics now of getting the sub rod bed in place. What do I mean by sub rod bed? So, a couple of different ways that you can do uh, layout one way, a fairly common way, is that you literally just screw or nail plywood straight on top of the framework, everything's flat, call it good. If you're modeling Midwest, US, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, somewhere like that, sure. Pretty flat, maybe you can get away with it. All of this layout is designed with this open uh, grid bench work, the idea being that the road bed itself is then going to be raised up a little bit, or lower it down, you know, move up and down depending on how you need it and so that you can then have the scenery kind of fall away from it. You're not covering everything in plywood, which would get really, really expensive on this kind of size of a layout. Um, and so usually the sub rod bed is only a little bit wider than the actual track bed itself is going to be, and then you have the track on top of that. So in the station area, ironically, <laughs> it's mostly going to be uh, in these plywood sections. It's not quite the whole thing. It's about an inch or so back, and it's about an inch or so flush from the other side. So it's just about wide enough to be able to do those platform areas. Not going to be all the way along the full 24 feet. I probably only need about two of these sheets, about 16 foot in length maybe. Um, but do still want to res it up. So I am going to make some rises that come up from underneath to res it up a couple of inches. Because as you would come around the return loop, like I mentioned earlier, this is going to kind of be the Port of Seattle area. This is where we start to go a little bit away from the prototype, but I wanted to model it. Now, a couple of ways that you can then say, okay, how am I going to do a port? I want the train track kind of elevated higher and the ships are going to sit lower at the docks. So we could cut into these um, joint, we could just cut out sections so we lower it down a little bit, but I do also have wiring running through here. Um, and so this is where if you have the roadbed raised up a little bit, then it gives you that kind of clearance. Um, a two inch rise equates to uh, a little over 20 feet or so in end scale and uh, you know that might be enough by the time you then have higher the plywood, higher the road bed, higher the track itself he probably is at 25, 28, maybe he's 30 feet up and so that would be okay. That, that would look acceptable I think in terms of having some ships in at the dock. If we had um, everything flat and flush against the benchwork over on the station side then it becomes a little bit harder to give the illusion that this is actually a port and there are actually ships that have come in to dock. So, the rest of this, and as we come around the return loop, that will be those kind of thinner strips of plywood, um, and they'll kind of come around. Same thing, on rises all the way around, and then later you add the scenery in. So, I'm going to go back over to the track plan that I had, figure out distances, figure out measurements, so I can see where I need to kind of start this plywood, and then make a bunch of those rises, so that we can start to get this raised up, and then get everything leveled. Alright, so, goodness me, was this fiddlier than I thought it was going to be. I need about three more hands and four more clamps to do this. So this is a mixture of uh, digital level, four foot level, eyeball level, and eight feet later we are right at 0, 0.0 degrees front to back. And it's not perfect because it's the way the wood is. Yeah, it's not really going to show. There we go. It is then 0, 0.0 degrees. There are some undulations in the wood ever so slightly. Um, that'll all send out. I'm not too concerned about it anyway because I'm when the, the road bed goes over it, the foam road bed goes over it, it's not going to be compressed down and so it's enough that it'll work out. But it is pretty much, you know, to the 0, 0.0 degree or to one tenth of a degree level um, along that eight foot length and front to back. 
and so like I said just short little risers we come underneath a couple of different ways that you could do this you could make cleats as well so it'd be the same kind of thing you'd have the riser but then you have a little bit of wood that comes out as well for a cleat and then you'd actually screw it from underneath that's kind of advantageous if you would potentially then look at moving it so for these big flat sections for the stations uh, they're pretty much going to stay in place i can move the track around on top of it and it'll be fine i can uh, move things you know left right front to back as i need to to figure out those platforms and those turnouts where it might be advantageous to come uh, screw from underneath with the cleats is when you start to come around um, some of the cups uh, you might get the geometry a little bit wrong you might want to change it a little bit and so if you screw from underneath then it's a whole lot easier to be able to just unscrew that because once the actual road bed is down and tracks down uh, you know a little bit hard to do one thing that you do need to think about though if you are going to screw in from the top like I have done is make sure that you recess the, uh, the screws. So I got, uh, I have some countersink uh, drill bits and so drill down number six uh, holes, countersink them and then when the screws go in they're going to be fully, uh, fully out of the way so that again once the uh, foam or cork whatever you want to use sub rod bed goes down uh, it's going to be out of the way and if you think eh, it's okay it's not protruding that much uh trust me having done this uh on an, uh, a double o slash echo layout where i thought that it does create ever so small undulations uh on that sub row bed it is a real pain in the butt so just countersink them a little bit as you go through. I've used 1x3 for these risers, could also have just used plywood. Uh, the reason why I went with the 1x3s was because I was going to screw down from the top. Essentially this would be the exposed part and I was pretty sure that when I would be screwing in this would just start to split. So again if you had cleats coming out maybe it's not as big of a deal so I just need to kind of think through what material you would be using. But that's the, the basic process. I'm going to try and do a little bit of a time lapse maybe uh, on this next one. We'll see. It is super duper fiddly but I'll at least look a little bit at what goes on. I've got one more 8 foot section to do and then that should give me uh, pretty much that full length of those uh, of those station plans. Okay, one thing that I did want to show quick is I've intentionally left this that's come square. I've intentionally left this so that the edge of the plywood doesn't fall right over the top of here and that helps with being able to join two sections together. Now right here I could have put it right kind of on the middle and that had risers come up both sides but if we come down to the other end of this section that would have made it a little bit hard because that would have been flush and I still need somewhere to be able to join so what I decided to do um, was leave this open and then basically you just cut another strip of plywood that's basically the width of that and it will go underneath attach screw it from the bottom this time rather than screwing it from the top and then lay the other board onto it and then once they're joined you might end up with a little bit of a, a difference between the two sections and so you just come over it with a styrofoam wrap and it, it's just kind of like a, a metal grated sander if you haven't seen one before and so it'll just bring it down to pretty much the same level and then when you do actually go over it with the electric sander it isn't having to do a whole lot of work so i'm going to screw this section in from the underside and then i can lay the other section on top and then start to add the risers and get the heights right for them all right so no idea if the little time lapse thing that i did actually worked at all i feel like i was standing way too much in front of it so if there is no time lapse that's why uh, this is then an 8 foot length of aluminum C channel that I have and as you can see in a little digital readout it kind of keeps hovering between 0.0, .0 and 0 0.1 degrees so I'm basically within one tenth of a degree and there's a one tenth degree of accuracy on that thing anyway. Um, so this is kind of how I've been making sure that everything is level along with eyeballing it um, just because there are very small undulations in the wood until it's sanded down uh, you know sometimes a digital level gets just wrong um, but this seems to work out pretty well and so then so long as uh, the plywood is touching all the way along you know that the rises are correct so this is now all the way along that 16 foot length we try and got to keep walking backwards there we go we can finally get to the end so this is two of those eight foot lengths of plywood 
awful lot of risers. Like I said, it's very fiddly. Uh, you do almost need uh, another pair of hands, even no matter how many helpers you have, and more clamps, more clamps, more clamps. Right, I do think that having uh, some kind of uh, straight edge like this, uh, again, this is just an eight foot length of aluminum C channel that I'm going to use for lighting over on um, the kind of the shelf lead above my workbench, but um, having some kind of straight line, so not a piece of lumber unless you've planned it yourself and you can guarantee that it's right. Uh, even a, a three foot or a four foot straight line, um, kind of like a yardstick or, or a four foot level um, is okay, but having that eight foot uh, guaranteed straight line uh, certainly helps an awful lot. So um, I'm going to sand the tops of these two sections of plywood now if we kind of step up. Um, yeah, it's somewhat of a smooth finish and I want to try and take out a little bit of those imperfections as much as I can. Um, and I also need to come down and see if uh, the shear form rasp will also then take away that joint before I sand. Alright, this is then with that cleaned up and sander does also come down and do the joint here. So it's now uh, very smooth between the two of those. So I'll use the same approach of having that kind of um, joint plate that will run underneath that screw from the bottom when I then come down to the ends here where we're going to then start to um, bring the curves away from the platforms and into where the turnouts are going to be here to then feed into, uh, feed into that return loop. So I think I might just lay some track down just so I can kind of get some kind of uh, sense of scale of what this is going to look like. Um, and then probably going to wrap this one up because this has got a little bit long with kind of going through what the track plan is going to be and it took a lot longer to actually get uh, this base in place just because there were so many rises and it was such a long length to try and make sure that everything was uh, was level and even. Alright, so I wanted to wrap up this video with uh, a little bit of track thrown down and get some kind of idea of uh, why I'm thinking here. So this is all Atlas Code 55 track. Like I said earlier, the turnouts are big, broad, number 10 turnouts. They look great for those long passenger trains going through them with those uh, passenger cars. And then in here, kind of replicating, simulating whatever the platforms are, is just some nine foot long strips of oak that are three quarters inches wide and one quarter inches tall. So in terms of the profile, by the time you have the one eighth track bed, one eighth inch track bed and then about one eighth of an inch on the actual track. The top of the platform is coming just a little bit above the rail. Um, and so this, this probably is actually going to be the material that will become the platforms that will obviously get painted and whatever. But it was also just to try and figure out uh, some kind of size. I think originally on the track plan, if you've been looking at the track plan, uh, the tracks were a little bit closer together. I think I had it about one and a quarter or one and a half inch set into center um one and a half inch i think set into center and then in the front yards it would probably be a little bit closer maybe it's one one and a quarter inch set to send the track spacing um had somewhat forgotten to account for how wide i wanted the actual platforms to be and so with that three quarter inch strip between them we then have the road bed um it's actually about two inches and right at two inches center to center on that track spacing uh, three quarter inch wide strips of oak for those platforms uh, become scale feet of about 10 feet wide on those platforms. Um, I'm working at N scale here, so three quarters of an inch equates to about 10 scale feet. So the platforms are a little bit narrower maybe than they probably would be in real life. In real life they're probably getting on for more like 12, possibly 15 feet. Not super duper wide though from looking at photos. Um, of what it would be and I think height wise actually it's 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 pretty darn close so these aren't cut to length um, those strips of oak like I said nine feet long but to give some kind of idea of what you know it would look like once the tracks laid out uh, I did shorten just a little bit the center run some um, I think I had originally had the, the turnout going another 12 to 18 inches or so um, but once I actually laid down that nine foot length I just think now I can probably shorten it a little bit I'm not going to save a ton on track and maybe just be able to cut out two or three pieces um, so I, I think 
we're at about 90 feet or so of that Code 55 track. This is all the Code 55 Atlas Flex track. Uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be using for the majority of the layout. And like I said, broad number 10 turnouts. Once we get into the yards, probably just tighten that down to number sevens, I think. Um, I don't know if I really need to go all the way down to number fives. We'll, we'll see. I've got so much space on the other side of the layout. Um, you know, I don't need to make them too tight, but at the same time, you know, I don't want them to look massive. It's kind of that balance, that compromise. So none of this is wired, none of this is glued down, you know, the whole, like, all the track lifts up and then the, the sub-row bed um, lifts up as well. Uh, sub-row bed, if you're wondering, this is the uh, Woodland Scenic track bed foam, uh, one eighth inch foam. Um, you can use cork, uh, which is probably a little bit more common, Midwest um, do uh, one eighth inch cork as well. The only kind of concern that I have with cork is the potential for drying out and getting brittle. Um, a club that I was a part of in Seattle had some of their modules as part of the, the layout that the club had. And, they, and admittedly they were getting old, they were 35, 40 years old. Um, but the cork on them was starting to get brittle and break away. Um, and it was starting to cause some problems with the track work and so the decision was made by the club that they would pull it up and they were going to switch to um, foam as the track pad. So people have different personal preferences. I have used this Woodland Scenic track pad foam before on previous layer. I honestly find it so much quicker and easier to work with than cork. Um, price wise it's about the same and the other part is right now you, just, you can't really buy cork. Um, and I, I don't know why it's such a supply constraint of cork at the moment, but um, trying to find any amount of usable uh, quantities of cork just not possible. So this is kind of what I'm looking at for now. I'm going to call this one a name because this video is getting kind of long, but this is an idea of what it's going to be. So in the next video, uh, I don't know if I'm going to work a little bit more over here and kind of start to figure out the actual positioning of all the track and all the turnouts and, and things like that. One thing that is immediately coming to mind is uh, that as cool as this looks and as cool as nice as it would be just to use those ground throws from Caboose Industries, I think I do probably need to be looking at some kind of um, turnout control point motors. Uh, if we come down, come back a little bit, this is at about my eye height. So it's actually a really, really good height by raising it up the, the two inches and then by the time we go the width of the plywood and the sub row bed and the track, this is actually a perfect height in my mind, um, you know, for rail finding to be able to stand and just slightly looking down on the trans as they come into the platforms, be able to see all the platform details, people standing down, things like that. Um, but it, it does mean that you've got to kind of reach up rather high so I do think that having some kind of fascia mounted um, buttons to be able to do turn controls would be the way to go. So I guess I might move forward and do that, but I also <laughs> would like to try and come in and try and do the rest of uh, the rest of this return loop, but I, I think I'm very, very rapidly running out of time. Um, but hope you enjoyed this one. Hope it's been a good uh, start give you some kind of overview of the, the track plan and what we're going for here and then finally starting to see some track down um, after a long, long time of construction. Now I'm starting to get some kind of idea of, uh, of what the railroad's going to look like. So thanks for watching, take care, um, and I'll maybe just get back before I have surgery, otherwise uh, I'll catch you at some point over the summer. Bye-bye.